We're just going to wait a few more minutes until um, everybody's signing. Another minute or so. Okay then, so welcome to Holocaust Museum Houston's virtual programs. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Tamara Savage, Managing Director, and it is my great pleasure to welcome Rebecca Erbelding as our guest speaker. Rebecca will take questions after her talk, um, and to participate, please submit your questions through the Q&A box, which can be found at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will do our best to get to as many of the questions as possible. This program is being recorded and will be available through our YouTube platform at a later date. And now just my pleasure to introduce Rebecca Abelding. She is the author of Rescue Board, the untold story of America's efforts to save the Jews of Europe, which won the JDC Herbert Katsky National Jewish Book Award in 2018. She holds a PhD in American history from George Mason University. Rebecca worked as an archivist and curator at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum from 2003 to 2015, and as an, an historian since 2015, including for the museum's Americans and the Holocaust exhibition. Her work has previously been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the New Yorker, and on the History Channel and National Geographic. America has long been criticized for refusing to give harbor to the Jews of Europe as Hitler and the Nazis closed in. Tonight, Rebecca will tell the extraordinary story of the Roosevelt administration's War Refugee Board and its effort to save the abandoned Jews of Europe. And now, Rebecca, it's over to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Tamara and Chris and everybody in Houston for inviting me and, and to all of you for being here with me. I'm going to talk a little bit about my book, about the research that went into it, and about the story that this that unfolds throughout the book. And I think one of the things that is really surprising to people is the subtitle of, of my book, which you should see on the screen here. The Untold Story of America's Efforts to Save the Jews of Europe. So most people, I think, come into learning about this with, with one of two impressions. Either they have the impression that the United States knew nothing about what was happening during the Holocaust that Americans find out at liberation. Um, they're horrified. But even if they had known, they wouldn't have done anything about it. Or conversely, Americans knew everything that all of the information was accurate, that they knew it as soon as things were happening in Europe, and they, of course, did not do anything about it. And the answer is just, it's much more complicated than that. Um, the United States, of course, does not have any one response to the Holocaust. Americans do not agree about much of anything now or then. And so Americans are fighting throughout the 1930s and 40s over what we should do about what we are hearing about what's happening in Europe. And by 1944, which we now know is very late in the war, the, the voices in favor of rescue and resistance win. Um, and so this is a period where even the US government policy is changing over time. And so what we know is that Rescue Board, my book, is about how we got to this moment where we have this new policy of rescue and relief how US immigration laws had been structured since the 1920s, specifically to keep out quote unquote undesirable immigrants, um, including Jews and Catholics. Uh, there was no refugee policy to speak of. So everyone who is trying to make it to the United States, all of the Jewish refugees who are trying to make it to the United States are referred to as refugees, but they are coming under a very specific immigration policy. The US has no refugee policy that would allow them to come any other way. Um, but that the American people actually have quite a lot of information. 
about what is happening to Jews in Europe, particularly in the 1930s. You can see here an article from Waco, uh, Sunday, April 2nd, 1933. And you can see if you look around this page, there's some local news. There's a plane crash. Pope Pius, uh, the, the Pope has started the new holy year. There's um, reports of the New Deal, uh, veterans benefits getting slashed. But the big headline is German commercial life paralyzed by anti-Jewish boycott. So this is a reference to the boycott of Jewish owned businesses throughout Nazi Germany on April 1st, 1933. Some newspapers were covering that in advance. Americans had that information in advance. And these efforts that, you know, the Nazi boycott of Jewish owned businesses, Jews being kicked out of the civil service, um, the boycott or the burning of books in May 1933, all of this results in actually a wave of protests in the United States, marches and rallies in at least 65 different cities. I think the word that we would use now is that this story went viral and Americans were responding to it. Um, when I was going through some of the, the records in the State Department, I found this document here, which is from the Houston Press to Secretary of State Cordell Hull. And it says, there was held in Houston, Sunday afternoon, April 2nd, so the same day as that newspaper article that I showed you, a mass meeting of citizens to discuss the treatment of Jews in Germany. And it says the meeting was called by the mayor at the request of the Christian ministers in the city. It was held at the Freemasons Temple, the Scottish Rite Cathedral. The auditorium and balconies were packed. All of these people, including the, head, the editor of the Houston Chronicle, of the Houston Press, made reports. Sorry, my cat is making noise over here. Stop it. Go away. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're live. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I apologize for the creaks. I'll introduce her if she hops up, when she hops up. <laughs> but, but you can see that this is, this is actually a story that people are paying attention to. These petitions, these notices, these letters came from over 500 different communities nationwide, all protesting what the Nazis are doing in Germany. The challenge is that we don't really have, as Americans, a long attention span. And so once this story falls off the front pages of newspapers, Americans largely stop paying attention and start paying attention again to the New Deal. Go away. To, <laughs> to um, the, and they double and triple down on these ideas of isolationism, that the United States should not have gotten involved in World War I. We're not gonna get involved in everything overseas, no matter what the Nazis do. This is not our place. We are not the people who need to be part of this. So it is a story of, of how Americans and their government are so anti-immigrant in the 1930s that a group of Jewish congressmen get together in the spring of 1938 and decide amongst themselves that they are not going to propose any new immigration legislation. That even though Americans seem to be sympathetic, the issue of actually increasing immigration is so toxic that any sort of discussion would just result in the lowering of the number of people who could come, not in the raising of it. Even at Kristallnacht, um, the night of broken glass in November 1938, you can see here um, Fort Worth reporting on um, Crystal knocked, And you can see, like, this is a big news day. Pearl Buck has gotten the Nobel Peace Prize. It's the 20th anniversary of the end of World War I. Ataturk, the, the um, president of modern Turkey, has, has uh, died. It is the two days after the midterm elections of 1938, in which the Republicans have gained um, dozens of seats in the House. But the big headline is anti-Jewish riots sweep Germany. And this will be the big headline for the next three weeks in the United States. It is a massive story in the United States, but it doesn't mean that the American people um, want to do what is the obvious solution at this point, which is open immigration and bring people who are being persecuted in Germany to the United States. So you can see here two polls from the end of November, 1938, the first, do you approve or disapprove of the Nazi treatment of Jews in Germany? 94% of Americans disapprove. And then the same people are asked, should we allow a larger number of Jewish exiles from Germany to come to the United States to live? And 72% of Americans say no. And so it's this gap between sympathy, Americans are sympathetic, and the willingness to be part of the solution. 
that, that kind of goes over this entire system and in this entire period. And the story of this refugee crisis, all of these people trying to get out desperately, especially after Kristallnacht, goes even past Pearl Harbor as there are still Jews in Casablanca, in Lisbon, um, in Southern France who are trying to make it out. Really though, my book is about what happens next because in the summer of 1942, as Americans who are still on the ground in Southern France are witnessing deportations um, from concentration camps, from inside, they are providing relief in the camps and they are witnessing trains leave. This message gets to the United States. Uh, Gerhard Rigner, who was the secretary of the World Jewish Congress in Switzerland, learned third hand from a German businessman that the Nazis had a plan that they were planning to carry out to round up all of the Jews of Europe, take them to the East and murder them there. You can see that he says here, received alarming report that in Führer's headquarters plan discussed and under consideration, all Jews in countries occupied or controlled Germany, number three and a half to four million should after deportation and concentration in East at one blow exterminated to resolve once and for all Jewish question in Europe. There are a couple of things that are wrong about this. Namely, it is not just a plan that is discussed and under consideration. It is a plan that is in effect and has been in effect for over a year. This information, Rigner tries to send it through the State Department to the United States to Stephen Wise, the head of the World Jewish Congress, his organization, one of the most famous rabbis in America, someone who knew President Roosevelt, figuring if I can get this information to Rabbi Wise, he will go to Roosevelt, the two of them will know what to do. The State Department blocked the message. They refused to allow it to be delivered to Wise. They stated that this is likely a war rumor. There's no sense in getting people riled up. We do not need to pass along this information. Rigner had a sense that that might happen. And so he also sent this information to England and England, uh, his, his um, colleague in England sent it to the United States via Western Union. That's what you're seeing here, is the message that actually arrived to Stephen Wise at the end of August 1942. Wise turned around and asked the State Department, what is happening? Is this true? And the people at the State Department he talked to didn't realize that their colleagues had already dismissed this as a war rumor, and they actually investigated. They talked to the Swiss, they talked to the Swedes, they talked to the Red Cross, and finally, by November 1942, they said, yes, this, this makes sense. This is what is happening. Um, and so the end of November 1942 is the moment that historians document this information really being disseminated to the American people. It appears in newspapers and magazines that the Nazis have a plan. They are trying to carry out the murder of all of the Jews of Europe, and more than 2 million people have already been killed. November 1942 is also the same month that the Allies landed in North Africa, Operation Torch. And so militarily, there's very little that could be done at this point. The, the Americans, the Allied armies are thousands of miles from the killing centers where most people are being murdered. And so the Americans, the Soviets, the Brits, um, nations in exile all get together. And you can see on the right of the screen, they issue a warning. They say, we condemn this bestial policy of cold-blooded extermination, and they promised to have war crimes trials after the war. They don't promise rescue. They promise war crimes trials after the war. That was the amount of um, effort that the Allies were willing to take at that point. But for more than a year after this, more and more information reaches the United States. It is now treated as valid information. Um, Activists stage elaborate rallies and stage shows trying to call public attention to what is happening to the Jews of Europe. In, or, in October 1943, there's an Orthodox rabbi's march on the US Capitol, which is what you're seeing here. Again, asking for some sort of rescue response. Nobody's quite sure what that response would look like, but there's got to be something we can do besides winning the war as soon as possible. And at this point in the story, a group of Treasury Department lawyers enter the picture, very unlikely heroes. Um, they had spent the summer of 1943 really fighting with the State Department. Um, the Treasury Department wanted to allow humanitarian aid to Europe. 
allow Jewish organizations like the World Jewish Congress to send humanitarian aid into Romania, into France, um, with, with guideposts to make sure that that money wouldn't fall into the hands of the Nazis. And the State Department consistently denied that permission and would not explain why and kept lying about why. So finally, in December 1943, one Treasury Department staff member sneaks into the State Department's file room and discovers that not only have these delays been deliberate, but that the Assistant Secretary of State, Breckenridge Long, had specifically instructed US diplomats in Switzerland to stop sending information about the Holocaust to the United States. That information was leaking out to activists and Long thought that if the activists don't know what is happening, they can't protest anymore and they won't put pressure on the US government to do more. So one of the best things about studying the Treasury Department is that Henry Morgan Dow Jr. was FDR's Treasury Secretary. So he was the only Jewish cabinet member. He was not particularly good with money, which you would think a Treasury Secretary should be. Um, but he was a really, really good manager. He hired good people and he trusted them to do their jobs. And he also was a fantastic record keeper and recorded um, almost all of his conversations. So you can actually go online now and you can read transcripts of almost every phone call, almost every meeting that Morgenthau had while he was Secretary of the Treasury. It's really one of the best resources we have about what was happening inside the Roosevelt administration. And so in December 1943, Josiah Dubois, who was the Treasury Department staff member who went inside, who stuck inside the, the State Department, says in one of these meetings, Mr. Secretary, the only question we have in our mind, I think, is the bull has to be taken by the horns in dealing with this Jewish issue and get this thing out of the State Department in some agency's hands that's willing to deal with it frontally. For instance, take the complaint, what are we going to do with the Jews? We let them die because we don't know what to do with them. And then Randolph Paul, who was the Treasury Department's general counsel, said, we are speaking as citizens now. And I remember when I first found this, um, going through all of the transcripts, th this part really struck me and this part got me kind of emotional because this idea that um, all of these Americans, they weren't Jewish, were saying, you know, we, we don't think this is necessarily a good policy position. We don't necessarily, we're not coming to you because um, we think it's a good idea politically, but we're citizens of the United States and we feel like our country is better than what the State Department is doing. And so armed with all of the evidence that they had gathered about the State Department, they wrote a new memo originally for Roosevelt and then, re or I'm sorry, originally for Morgenthau and then rewritten for Roosevelt. Um, this is one of the later drafts uh, entitled Personal Report to the President on the Acquiescence of this Government in the Murder of the Jewish Population of Europe. This is not a, a really a, a government memo title that you see very often. And the, the memo begins, one of the greatest crimes in history, the slaughter of the Jewish people in Europe is continuing unabated. Unless remedial steps of a drastic nature are taken and taken immediately, I'm certain that no effective action will be taken by this government to prevent the complete extermination of the Jews in German controlled Europe, and that this government will have to share for all time responsibility for this extermination. So they decided to go to Roosevelt. And on January 16th, 1944, Roosevelt and two members of his staff, or I'm sorry, Morgenthau and two members of his staff met with Roosevelt. Um, they convinced him to issue an executive order taking quote unquote refugee matters out of the hands of the State Department and creating a new government agency called the War Refugee Board. He announced that it was US policy to try to provide relief and to rescue Jews and other victims of Nazi persecution. This new agency was officially headed by the secretaries of war state and treasury, um, but it was almost certainly and, and totally a treasury department operation. Their offices were at the treasury department. Henry Morgenthau stayed involved the entire time. Um, it was staffed almost, almost exclusively by John Paley, who was 35 year old um, head of foreign funds control, which was the, the department of treasury that was in charge of economic sanctions. Um, so in the previous couple of years, he had supervised 2000 people 
and was responsible for $8 billion in 1944 of sanctioned material. And so bringing him over to head this war refugee board was a real move. Uh, like this was a guy who knew how to do things. Um, so for the first time in 1944, the United States had a policy about the Holocaust. It was a policy of rescue and relief. And when the war in Europe ended 17 months later, this war refugee board had saved tens of thousands of lives. So my book, Rescue Board, is, is really the first book that is not self-published that is about the war refugee board, um, who they were and what they did. And this seemed really strange to me as I was writing it, because there are so many books that come out about the Holocaust every year. Um, and for the last decade, I kind of waited for somebody to write faster than I do and to get the story out there. Um, you can see here some of the titles of some of the more common books about American response to the Holocaust. And you can see that based on the title, they are taking the kind of long view of American response writ large. The Jews were expendable, the abandonment of the Jews, why we watched, while six million died. These are taking this history from beginning to end, really focusing on the government. And the War Refugee Board just ends up being this chapter at the end where it says it was terrible and, but oh yes, there was a war refugee board. It was great, but it was too little and too late. And that was interesting to me. One, because none of them to my mind sufficiently covered why and how US policy changed. Like th that is actually something that is really instructive, I think to study why policy changes and how policy changes because that is the thing that we can use to change policy now, if there's something that we don't like. Um, the War Refugee Board really mattered in this story. It mattered for the tens of thousands of people whose lives um, were saved by the board. And these books, I think, have contributed to this memory that we, that we have that I talked about at the beginning of this unbroken narrative arc of American anti-Semitism and indifference. And there are pieces of that story that are true. You know, the greatest generation win, won the war and afterwards we all learned about the Holocaust. And I don't think that the War Refugee Board really fits within the narrative that these books are telling. Um, it's this hard right turn in the narrative where everything changes and suddenly, you know, the US is actively trying to rescue people. And so by forgetting about the establishment of the border, what they did, um, or relegating it to the last chapter, we lose the ability to learn from what they were doing um, and how they tried to save lives. There is another much more basic reason that the War Refugee Board really hasn't, I think, gotten the attention that it deserves. And it is the records of the War Refugee Board. So the, the actual archival records, the documents that they kept are at the FDR library in Hyde Park, New York. Um, it's about 120 boxes of material. They are still in the original order that the secretaries kept them in, in 1944, 1945. Um, and so the, the few historians who have written about the War Refugee Board, most of their books I showed you on the previous screen, what they have done is just looked at small sections of this. It's really hard to look at 120 boxes. I know this. And so they've looked at, you know, I'm going to write the chapter on what the War Refugee Board is doing in Turkey. So I'm going to look at the boxes that are just labeled Turkey. So to reconstruct the board's work, I actually spent about two years digitizing the entire collection, um, either looking at stuff on microfilm and recording and copying that, or photographing things that had never been put on microfilm, going up to Hyde Park and using a handheld camera to photograph absolutely everything. Um, after deleting duplicates, I had about 19,000 individual PDFs of documents, um, each PDF being you know one page for one page document, 40 pages becomes one PDF. Um, and I had about 19,000 PDFs, so representing about 100,000 pages of material. I doubled that with, with material from the FDR, other material from the FDR library, from the Holocaust Museum. Um, I talked to most of the families of um, people whose parents had been part of the War Refugee Board and got their papers. And so I ended up with about 43,000 PDFs at the end of it. After converting all of these images, um, to PDF, I gave each PDF a specific name. Um, so you can see here kind of a breakdown of what this name means. 440621 WRB R08 F11 D179 tells me that this PDF um, is a document that was written on 1944, June the 21st. 
It is in War Refugee Board Records Reel 8, Folder 11, Document 171. So I knew exactly where that PDF was located in all of the boxes and all of the microfilm reels. So I could find it again really easily. Um, but it also meant that when you have all of these records with titles like this and you put them in one folder, they sort chronologically. And so no matter where I had gotten this material, gotten it from a family member, gotten it from the National Archives, gotten it from the FDR library, when it all went into one folder, everything that was dated 1944, June 21st, showed up in the same area. Um, and so I could go through and I could actually read what the War Refugee Board was doing day by day. And this proved incredibly valuable. You know, you, you have to know, but if you were just treating it like, here's everything that's happening in Turkey, here's everything that's happening in Sweden, you don't understand how something in Turkey might have impacted something in Sweden. You can't look at these things in isolation because the people who are living through this experience are not looking at things in, in solid blocks of time. You know, think about your own email. You're dealing with 20 things over the course of the day, and so were they. And so I really wanted to capture that, and I really wanted to try to get a sense of their mindset and get a sense of what information they had. Um, who was Whose ear did they have at that moment? Who were they talking to? What were they fighting for? And that helped kind of unwrap this story. It, was, it also matters, you know, the course of the war. Rescue looks very different before D-Day than it does after D-Day, when the U.S. has a, an actual foot in Western Europe. Um, so by reading through chronologically, I could tell how much time they spent on various projects, whether or not they were successful, what information they had, and I could really avoid the historian trap of hindsight, you know, knowing what I know and then reading it backwards on the history. I could read the history as they lived it. So the War Refugee Board tried so many different things um, that I'm just going to give you a kind of quick overview of some of the things that they did. This is a, a picture before I go of my the database that I use um, to, um, to go through all of the documents. So you can see that I can take notes, uh, I can see the actual image, um, and uh, it has proven invaluable because I can I can pull things up in about 30 seconds, anything that I'm looking for. I never had to go searching for it, which is incredible. Um, so the same day in January 1944 that, that Roosevelt created the War Refugee Board, um, the staff immediately streamlined the process that aid organizations would use to send money to Europe. Um, it is small and it is bureaucratic, but it has probably made the biggest impact on the lives of um, people who were uh, suffering in Europe. So by the end of the war, the War Refugee Board had authorized the equivalent, the 2021 equivalent of about $160 million in humanitarian aid. Um, that money went to buy guns for the French underground. It went to um, buy passes to allow Jews to escape over borders. It paid people who were hiding children. Um, it provided the creation of false papers. Um, and a whole host of aid organizations, Christian and non-Christian, uh, used them to send money into Europe. The board also um, appointed representatives in Turkey, in Switzerland, in Sweden, in Portugal, in North Africa, and eventually in London. And those were most of the neutral nations of Europe. And their job was, those representatives' jobs were to put pressure on those neutral governments, to tell the government of Turkey to allow more Jews over their borders, um, to pass on information of what their diplomats were seeing overseas, uh, to protest what the Nazis were doing. Um, most of these representatives were Treasury Department employees, though their representative in Turkey was a narcissistic Bloomingdale's marketing executive who was taking a vacation in Turkey anyway and decided that he wanted to go and go on behalf of the US government, he ends up getting about 8,000 Jews into Palestine, into pre-state Israel, um, through Turkey, into Syria, and then across the border into Turkey, even after the white paper. So these people were there to leverage allied victory. It was very clear to most observers that the allies were likely to win the war. And so they could put pressure on the neutral governments to say, you have not done your job through this war. Um, you have not spe um, specifically stood up to the Nazis 
now is your moment. Now you can curry favor with the United States to do so. So from Washington, um, John Paley, the head of the War Refugee Board, you can see him here on the right, laid out his strategy. Uh, his strategy was to persuade the Nazis and their collaborators to stop the killing, very difficult, um, to, and then to take action to rescue those who could still be saved, either by um, getting Jews who are on the borders of enemy territory in places like Romania or Bulgaria to get them to safety, or in France to get them across the border to Spain, and for people deep inside Nazi territory, in, in Poland, in Hungary, to keep them alive as long as possible, to keep them alive long enough to be liberated at the end of the war. So I'm gonna give you a quick example of each one. So the board launched a propaganda warfare campaign in the spring of 1944. They dropped leaflets from planes, they sent radio broadcasts into Nazi territory, um, targeting would-be perpetrators and reminding them that the US had already promised post-war justice, that we are coming for you. On March 24th, Roosevelt got in on this and issued a statement that was written by the War Refugee Board that echoed some of the memos that they had sent to him uh, a couple of months earlier. So he writes, or he, in quotes, writes, in one of the blackest crimes of all history, begun by the Nazis in the day of peace and multiplied by them a hundred times in time of war, the wholesale systematic murder of the Jews of Europe goes on unabated every hour. So March 1944, when, when Roosevelt issues this, is actually a very pivotal moment in the history of the Holocaust, because a few days before this, um, this warning goes out, the Nazis invaded Hungary. Hungary was the largest and last intact Jewish population in Europe. There were still about 800,000 Jews in Turkey or in, in Hungary, um, 600,000 Hungarian and Romanian Jews, um, and 200,000 people who had escaped to safety, what they hoped would be safety in Turkey. In fact, one of the first pieces of humanitarian aid that the War Refugee Board approved once it was um, created, was $100,000 to help people escape from Poland to safety in Hungary. So the War Refugee Board immediately panics when they hear about the invasion of, or in the occupation of Hungary, and they add a new paragraph to Roosevelt's warning, specifically looking at Hungary. They write, as a result of the events of the last few days, hundreds of thousands of Jews who, while living under persecution, have at least found a haven from death in Hungary and the Balkans are now threatened with annihilation. That these innocent people who have already survived a decade of Hitler's fury should perish on the very eve of triumph um, would be a major tragedy. So it is very difficult to be able to measure the effects of propaganda, the effects of psychological warfare. You can't count the number of people who survived because a perpetrator was deterred from committing acts of violence. Um, but as part of the research for this book, I actually found a, an elderly German man who remembered receiving this leaflet. He found it in a potato field in April, 1944. He was a member of the Hitler Youth. And um, he said that, you know, allied propaganda was really smart, that on the back of this were reports of local bombings. So we have just bombed this factory in this town near you. And he knew on the ground that that was true. And so he said that this was how he first read about the Holocaust and he, it actually made a lot of sense to him. This is the moment that he started believing that that was what was happening. The US government through the War Refugee Board also laundered money to help refugees sneak into Sweden. So I have, I have given this talk or versions of, of talks at the Treasury Department before. Um, as you can imagine, the Treasury Department loves hearing about the heroism of the Treasury Department. And um, the last time I gave it, they came to me in advance and said, can you, can you maybe not call it money laundering this time? And I said, well, but it was money laundering. And they said, yes, 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 yes. But we don't want to get a reputation as a, as a government agency that, that was laundering money. And so I'm gonna leave it to you, you decide whether the US was laundering money. Um, but this is, so this is Ivor Olson. This is the War Refugee Board's representative in um, Sweden. He is the Stockholm Legation's financial attache, which sounds like a very boring job, um, except he is actually an OSS spy. 
precursor to the CIA. He is there to monitor in Sweden to monitor the movement of money and war material between Sweden and Nazi Germany. So when he takes on this war refugee board job, it's actually his third full time job. He has his spy job. He has his cover job. And now he has this refugee job. Among other things, he is the man who recruits Raoul Wallenberg, the now famous Swedish businessman who goes to Hungary to rescue Jews in the summer of 1944. Um, and as you know, Wallenberg establishes safe houses, he issues protective papers, he saves thousands of people. He is not the money laundering story, that is a different story. Um, so the money laundering story is, is that for much of 1944, Olsen is not focused on what's happening in Hungary. Olsen is focused on trying to get Jews out of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia by water. He says that um, he needs the most skillfully organized type of underground operations because the Baltic countries are virtually sealed to everything. But he thought if he could get enough money, he could get six to 700 religious, racial, political refugees out of each of those countries and into Sweden um, if he only had the money. The War Refugee Board pays for this project directly out of funds from Roosevelt. Um, they had a secret stash of money that they didn't have to tell anybody how they were spending it. And so they use Roosevelt's money, but they don't want the Swedes to know that they are doing this. They don't want Sweden to know that they are um, funding unregulated illegal refugee entry into their country. And even Swedish Jews, Olsen writes to the board, quote, are very interested in Jewish relief and rescue operations as long as they don't involve bringing them to Sweden. So John Paley, who, who is part of his treasury department work, had been working in economic sanctions, had been paying attention to how people sneak money in and out of countries, decides that he is going to sneak this money into Sweden. So Paley contacts the staff at Goodyear Tire in Akron, Ohio. Um, no doubt they were astonished that the US government is asking about this. And the Goodyear Tire folks agree that the War Refugee Board will put $50,000 on their books of their company in Akron, their factory in Akron. And in exchange, their factory in Norrköping, Sweden, will give $50,000 worth of Swedish kroner to Ivor Olsen to fund this operation. There are no references to the Goodyear Tire deal in any of the War Refugee Board's papers. Um, it is entirely likely and probable that they scrubbed them. There is a $50,000 entry in the financial ledger that is marked Goodyear Tire, but no correspondence about it at all. But as I said, Henry Morgenthau Jr., the Secretary of Treasury, kept immaculate records, and the War Refugee Board staff forgot to scrub his. And so in his records, you can find this cable uh, from Olson in June 1944 saying, this arrangement worked well, and although not foolproof, it is, it is desirable from a security point of view. At this time, we do not recommend bank transfers as receipt of cable transfers of such size by individuals involved in operations unavoidably attract notice and suspicion. So instead of getting six to 700 people out, um, this operation gets about 4,000 people out. Um, as far as we know, none of them are Jewish in part because the Jewish populations of those countries, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia are, are for the most part gone. And those who do remain are deep in hiding and understandably very nervous about this scheme of emerging from hiding, getting to the beach, boarding a speedboat, and then trying to make it to the island off the coast of Sweden. And so most of the people who are escaping are actually probably escaping the Soviet Union, uh, which is about to um, enter and liberate um, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. But the War Refugee Board didn't really ask very many questions. In Switzerland, which is deeply surrounded um, and entirely surrounded by enemy territory, by Nazi territory, the War Refugee Board recruited Roswell McClelland. Uh, he was 30 years old. He was an aid worker with the American Friends Service Committee who had been working in Southern France in 1942. He is one of the people who witnessed deportations from inside the Les Miel internment camp. Um, he was providing aid on behalf of the Quakers and, and watched his friends be taken away by train in the summer of 1944. I'm sorry, the summer of 1942. He escaped over the border into Switzerland at the end of 1942, uh, right as the Nazis were invading southern France um, with his wife, and who was pregnant with their first child. 
And when the War Refugee Board came calling, you know, they needed to find someone who was inside Switzerland. They couldn't take somebody inside because it was entirely a surrounded country. Nobody could go in and out. And among a lot of other things, um, McClellan participates in ransom negotiations with the Nazis. The Nazis were looking around and seeing kind of the same landscape as everybody else, seeing that the Allies were likely to win the war. And so some high ranking Nazis thought, well, maybe we can get something for the Jews. If the United States cares so much about their fate, maybe we can trade something for them. And so the US, of course, is never going to pay ransom. But McClelland and Sally Meyer, who was the joint representative inside Switzerland, um, decided that they were going to string along a group of high ranking Nazis for about seven months. Um, in November 1944, McClelland even travels to Zurich to one of the big banking hotels in downtown Zurich and meets in the basement of that hotel with SS Oberstrom von Führer Kurt Becker, who reports directly to Adolf Eichmann. Um, Becker is wearing his SS uniform and McClellan says that he is there as proof of Roosevelt's personal interest in the negotiations in the ransom deal. Um, so during World War II, a, a high ranking US government representative held a top secret meeting with an SS officer specifically to negotiate on humanitarian matters. And as a result of this meeting, McClellan and Meyer gate about 1600 Jews out of Bergen-Belsen delivered to the border of Switzerland as a good faith gesture on the part of the Nazis for carrying out the negotiation. Beyond all of this, the War Refugee Board opens a refugee camp in upstate New York. They bring about a thousand mostly Jewish refugees to live there, um, arguing that we can't be hypocrites, that we can't give the Nazis the, this is a quote, the pretense of justification that the allies while speaking in horrified terms of the Nazi treatment of Jews never once offered to receive them. These people are kept um, in Oswego, New York at Fort Ontario um, and they are kept behind barbed wire until early 1946. The War Refugee Board sent 300,000 food packages into concentration camps in the final weeks of the war. So if you've ever heard a survivor give testimony about receiving a food package, it was almost certainly packed on Long Island, shipped across the ocean, disguised as a Red Cross package, and delivered to Dachau, to Buchenwald, to Sachsenhausen, to Ravensbrück in the final weeks of the war. Um, they pass along requests to the War Department to bomb the rail lines, gas chambers, and crematoria at Auschwitz, or to, to just wipe the camp off the face of the earth. Um, they also give Americans for the first time information, detailed information, about the process of arrival and selection and gassing at Auschwitz. They produce this report, which is um, gathered from testimony by escapees from Auschwitz in the spring of 1944. This report gets to the United States in the fall of 1944 and without asking permission from anybody in the US government, the War Refugee Board leaks it to the press. They leak it to 200 different newspapers nationwide. Uh, it results in front page news, Thanksgiving weekend, 1944. This is, um, this is Louisville, the Louisville Courier, reproducing as much of the report as possible. And a week later, the, the Washington Post issued an editorial entitled Genocide. It was the first time that word was used in an American newspaper. Um, so there are so many stories that, of things that the War Refugee Board does, including uh, personally saving the parents of Zsa Zsa Gabor. Um, so I, I can't get into all of them. We can in the Q&A talk about anything that you want. Um, and I hope that you, that you pick up the book. Um, so in conclusion, I, I think the War Refugee Board's creation was and remains the only time the U.S. government ever tried to do something like this. The only time we create a new government agency dedicated to saving the lives of people who are being persecuted by our wartime enemies. And so the 21 months between January 1944, when the board is created, and September 1945, when it shuts down, represents this moment in American history where our rhetoric about our democratic values actually matches the things that we're doing. Um, and in contrast to, to many subsequent human rights efforts, there's no secondary motive. This is not a Cold War effort. This is not because these refugees, these immigrants have value to us. Um, it is not driven by political power or votes from a minority group. 
the refugees who were in peril were never meant to become Americans. Most Americans still after the war do not want Jews to come here as immigrants. But, um, and most of them will never know and never knew that the US had any interest in their survival. Um, Yehuda Bauer, who is still around and, and an amazing historian and professor emeritus at Yad Vashem, wrote once that what made the War Refugee Board such a unique body is that it was officially permitted to break practically every important law of a nation at war in the name of outraged humanity. And so one of my goals with this book and, and this talk and is to hope that and help the War Refugee Board enter our public narrative about the Holocaust because it is incredibly relevant history. The board debated many of the challenges that we're still debating today. They debated the role of ransom negotiations um, to save the lives of innocent victims. They debated the pull between trying to provide for relief for a lot of people or trying to save a few. They debated how to bring refugees to the United States when there are very real national security concerns. And they debated how many resources they could risk falling into the hands of the enemy. And so when we debate these things today, if we don't look back on this history, um, we, we can. We can honor their efforts by remembering them, both because their efforts were real and worthy of honor, and because we need to study them as we continue to confront today's challenges. So while the US could and should have done much more um, especially in the 1930s, what the War Refugee Board staff really did matters. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and then see what kind of questions you have. Um, we've got about 15 minutes. So I see Diane asks, has the War Refugee Board, had the War Refugee Board existed earlier, would it have been able to make an even greater impact? I think so. It's really hard. Um, anytime anybody asks a historian a hypothetical, I'll explain like my argument and then I'll explain all the reasons why my argument's probably wrong. Um, you know, that's how, that's kind of how we're trained. So there are things that the War Refugee Board or that a War Refugee Board absolutely could have done, um, could have put much more pressure on the neutral nations earlier. I think that could have actually made a, a big impact. Um, even just stated outright that it is our policy um, to try to rescue people or and that we want these people to be rescued. That was something that we did not actually say uh, until much later. But it really does also matter that the allies were winning the war. I think that gave us a lot more leverage over these neutral nations. Um, it, it got us partners where we didn't we wouldn't have had partners um, had this happened earlier. And so there are moments in 1941, 42, 43 where I can foresee, you know, kind of places where the story might have turned had there been an agency like this. But some of the big efforts really, it really does take until it's very clear that allied victory is inevitable. Um, Mike says, what do you think was the reason the State Department was so opposed to broadcasting the information they had in 1942? So they argued that it was a war diversion. That I don't think they're right about that first. And I think there's a lot of anti-Semitism um, and nativism embedded in that argument. Um, but they really did argue that, um, that if we try to do something to rescue people, it's going to take away from our actions in the war. And I, and like I said, I think they're wrong. I don't think that, you know, what the War Refugee Board shows is they were not diverting efforts from the war effort, that this was actually, you know, a way to show um, that the United States was a different country than Nazi Germany, that we were a country that promoted freedom, that we were a country that promotes human dignity. And so that, that is an important psychological move that the U.S. can make. Um, the State Department largely disagreed with that. Uh, Hi asks, did anyone on the War Refugee Board speak about their experiences after the war? They did. Um, not a lot, not as much as I as a historian would like. Um, only one of them kept a diary at the time, and that was Ira Hirschman, the um, Bloomingdale's executive in Turkey, kept an amazing diary um, that showed that his three subsequent memoirs were mostly made up. Um, that's the thing, is when you actually leave a lot of historical evidence and then write extremely um, hyperbolic memoirs later, I, as a historian, can go back and show, you know, the places that you were exaggerating, and I... And there's a lot of those places in his memoirs. Um, he's the only one who really wrote memoirs. Uh, a number of War Refugee Board people gave 
um, interviews to Claude Landsman when he was putting Shoa together, the long documentary series in the 1970s. Not all of them made the final cut. Um, so I was able to get copies of their interviews and that was very helpful. But many of them did not really talk about it. They went back to being, you know, DC lawyers after the war. And I think this was a, a story that they either didn't think people were interested in, um, they didn't certainly see themselves as heroes, that, that's true across the board. Um, and then when it did seem like people were interested in it, people asked them about the State Department. Why was the State Department anti-Semitic? They asked them about bombing Auschwitz. They didn't ask them about some of the many things that the War Refugee Board actually did do. And so I think there was, when, when the tone of the interviews was really about why didn't the US do more, you know, I think some of them got a little resentful of like, but but we tried so hard and we we really did do a lot of things and please ask me about those things. And nobody really did in their lifetimes or not very many people did. Um, and so I, I hope that in the book, I'm able to shed light on some of the smaller stories that may not have made some of those larger books. Um, Vicky wants to know the four men on the book cover. I will put my screen back up just so you can see what she's talking about. So this is Cordell Hull here on the far left. Uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but he's he's the kind of one who's looking vaguely off into the distance. Um, he is the Secretary of State, and he really was not super involved in the War Refugee Board, did not keep a close tight rein on his staff, did not know um, most of what the State Department was doing, and made it his job not to know what his staff was doing. Uh, in the middle, you have Henry Morgenthau, um, so very involved with what his staff was doing, very um, in the weeds with the War Refugee Board. Uh, here is Henry Stimson, who is the Secretary of War, um, a Republican, uh, did not necessarily think the U.S. should bring more immigrants to the country, uh, did not think the, US, the War Refugee Board should publicize anything about Auschwitz. Um, he, you know, is not very involved. And then you have on the right, John Paley, the head of the War Refugee Board. Um, Ken wants to know, how seriously did the US government take the proposal to bomb Auschwitz? There are a couple of different proposals actually, and it, it unfolds over the spring, well, between really June and November, 1944. So June, 1944, the first requests make it to the War Refugee Board. The War Refugee Board passes them on. The War Department says, this is not our priority. This is a diversion of resources. At that moment, I think it's pretty convincing to the War Refugee Board. We've just landed on D-Day. If they say they don't have the planes, we're not going to touch it. Um, it comes up again a couple of times over the course of the summer. In November, once the War Refugee Board gets that report of Auschwitz, um, they actually start advocating for bombing. Uh, John Paley meets with um, John McCloy, the Assistant Secretary of War, and says, I, I really think we need to do this. And McCloy once again says, this is not our priority. This is not um, something that we think we should do. So the War Refugee Board really did think about it and, and took it seriously. It does not seem like the War Department ever did any sort of study, feasibility study, or really look into it. And historians have debated this for decades at this point. Um, I think we all agree now that it was possible, that the US is certainly flying the planes, but targeted bombing is not so possible. <laughs> and so whether it would have been successful is the thing that um, is, the, is the big debate now. And obviously that's something that we will never know. Um, so that is, that is kind of the state of the debate. We are stalemated um, as, as historians arguing with each other about that one. Um, Nada asks, was there any impact from the rescue efforts through Marseille? So um, Roswell McClellan, the guy in Switzerland is actually involved in, in some of that. Um, he's there a little bit later than Varian Fry and Hiram Bingham. The War Refugee Board does meet with Fry, uh, who in 1944 is acting as, is, is working as a journalist. They meet with him and they actually talk about sending him to Spain as their representative. This falls through um, in part because Fry's connections uh, with left organizations in the US with, with um, you know, he is seen as too political 
for them to hire on behalf of the US government. Um, Hi wants to know how many people on the board and how many were Jews. So the War Refugee Board at its peak in the summer of 1944 had about 65 staff members. Um, I would say, let's see, five or six were Jewish. And so it is, it is overwhelmingly a non-Jewish group. This does not actually come up very much in anybody's testimony, anybody's interviews afterwards. I don't think that um, if, if they saw this in terms of religion, they didn't talk about that. And so often you will see people talking about the war refugee board as, but they were overwhelmingly Christian. That is true. I don't think they were very religious people though, most of them. And so their motivation, I don't think is tied necessarily to religion. I think the, based on everything that I've read, all of their transcripts, all of their discussions, this is a group of people who deeply believed that human beings need to look after human beings. And I think they, they saw what was happening in the Holocaust as human beings. Um, and so I don't, I don't really see a, a big motivation religion wise, but Ira Hirschman in Turkey was, was Jewish. Um, Jim Abramson, who was kind of the, the supervisor of a lot of the different relationships that they had with some of the aid organizations, he was Jewish. And they had very close relationships with the staff of the JDC, um, with, with um, Joe Schwartz, um, with Moses Lovett. Um, the, the senior leadership of the JDC actually comes down to Washington and briefs these guys on how to do rescue work and like what do you do because the the joint had been doing this work and had been had the connections in Europe and so they really they become the I would say the most trusted organization um, with the U.S. government. So that is all the questions up now. I think there's um, something in the chat box from Sandy. Oh sorry. Oh I see it okay. So Sandy says, did you find a paper trail about the decision not to bomb the tracks? Yes. Um, of the 43,000 or so documents that I found, there's about 100 that relate to bombing Auschwitz. It actually is not a major story for the War Refugee Board. So while it comes up multiple times in June, in the summer, in November, um, it is not the big project that they have, the thing that is top of mind. It really doesn't show up much in their records. And so when the war, if, when the war department says no, they kind of let it drop at that point, um, both in the summer and in November, even after they were doing this. Um, and then Sandy says, how can we are, react differently now to genocides not yet so widely recognized such as the Uyghurs and so on? We know about these, but nothing happens. I think that's true. Um, and I think there are some lessons that we can learn from the War Refugee Board here. And one of them is to let your elected representatives know that this is something that you care about. Um, I think people do respond to public pressure. They do respond to phone calls. And when they think that no one in their constituency cares about this, um, there's no pressure on them to do anything about it. Um, that this is what we see with the creation of the War Refugee Board. It's not just this battle between the Treasury Department and the State Department. It is also all of this public pressure throughout 1944 that makes it a good political decision for Roosevelt to do. Um, he was very eager often throughout his presidency to just say, work it out yourselves. Like you have this argument between Treasury and State. I don't really care. I don't need to be part of it. You guys work it out, you're grownups. Um, but the, and, and he very well could have said that when the Treasury Department came to the state, came to him with their complaints about the State Department, but there was enough public interest and public pressure that Congress had gotten involved, that Congress was debating a bill to ask Roosevelt to create a commission too. And so even though there wasn't a clear sign that that was going to go anywhere in the House, like that it was there. And so Roosevelt could, could kill a couple of birds with this one stone um, and created this agency. And so I do think that public pressure matters. Um, I think writing something, I think keeping yourself informed, I think making sure that other people in your life know what's happening um, with, with trusted information, like that, that stuff actually is, it doesn't seem like it's a lot 
and it gets frustrating, but it is really something to do. I'm going to ask the last question, and mm -hmm. that is, did, um, did the War Refugee Board work with HIAS at all? They did. Um, not as much, but they do come up. Um, they are, I mean, HIAS is in many ways tied with the JDC in terms of immigration. Um, and then HIAS is so involved in helping people once they got here. And uh, so HIAS's main efforts, as I understand them, in 1944 is they were some of the main people who are helping the refugees who ended up at Fort Ontario. And so you see them show up a lot in, um, in kind of the early part of the history in the 1930s and early 1940s. And then really when the refugees arrive at Fort Ontario, they're some of the main people who are getting them Torahs, who are getting them, um, they, they get a mikvah for the women, they get kosher food, they get books and sweaters and, and ice skates for the kids. And like, they are really involved in helping these people once they're here. Um, so since they had done so much work um, trying to get people out, they then focus on when that is not a possibility anymore, they start to focus on making sure that people um, are here, that they are getting jobs, that they're with their families, that they're integrating into their communities, um, really kind of working on uh, helping people here. And so that's where they show up in this story. Well, thank you so much, Rebecca. You know, you've done such a lot of work and research on this topic, and you really know it inside out. I have to say, it's really fascinating. I just also wanted to mention that we are having an event uh, on, about the Uyghurs. Um, somebody had sent me it's um, going to take place, I think, on Thursday. Amy, I think if you're watching, what can you give me the information? I, I don't have it in front of me. You can just type it in and I can mention it quickly. Um, Anyway, look, look on our website uh, about it um, and um, please participate in that. Also, um, I, I'm very Thursday, grateful. Thursday, 6 p.m. What? She says Thursday, 6 p.m. There you go, Thursday, 6 p.m. Thank you. Um, so we are very grateful for um, everybody uh, taking their time to um, participate in this program tonight and I'm going to close it out now and um, thank you very much all for joining us on this um, webcast and good night. Okay, everyone's out. Well, thank you so much. Uh, that was, you really know your topic inside out. Wow, Rebecca. <laughs> I was really fascinated. And you also mentioned um, Raoul Wallenberg. Do you talk about, do you give talks about that? You're on mute. I do. Um, I did uh, the Bellin lecture for the University of Michigan. Um, their kind of Jewish studies lecture in March. Mm -hmm. And it was specifically about the War Refugee Board and Raoul Wallenberg. And so there was an article that went along with it. So I can send that to you if you're interested. Um, but yes. Because I know people are, I mean, it's come up over the years. So people are always so fascinated mm -hmm. by Raoul Wallenberg. And we've had survivors here who were, you know, rescued by him. Um, oh, interesting. No longer alive. I think um, her name was Alice Kahana. Oh, yeah. Uh, Alice uh, Watt. 
yeah, yeah Alice Lakahana, yeah. and you know she you know spoke about yeah. him. So that's maybe a topic that I could sure. maybe contact with you in the future about. I'd Absolutely. really love to hear sure. more about that. Yeah. Sure. So thank you again. Um, we had thank you for having 34 me. Thirty-four people. That's uh, not on, bad. And no, they asked really and they asked great questions. They did. Yep. Yeah. All on topic. All. Yeah. Um, and we we filled the time without having to grasp. So <laughs> right. well, that's, that's a good sign. Yeah. Well, right. again, thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks much so much for having me. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.